Good morning. It's a pleasure to see everyone this morning again, to be back with you, visiting with you. Always thankful for the opportunities to give New a break so that he can, uh, I'll fix, I'll prepare the main course and he can uh, just focus on being a good host. It's always a nice excuse to come back. Apparently, there are a great many people greatly concerned about their ability to become great conversationalists. I searched awkward conversations on the computer hoping to find a YouTube video that I could lead off with. I wanted to be up to date and current and I wanted to impress new that I could incorporate videos into my messages, you know, like a hip youngster. Um, uh, But I didn't find anything. And uh, one of the first things that came up though was called uh, uh, 29 most awkward conversations ever to occur. They really weren't conversations, they were more exchanges, you know, somebody said something and someone responded in an inappropriate way, but it doesn't really match, but some of them really made me laugh out loud, so I'm going to share some of them with you anyway. Meant to say, hold on for a second, give me a minute to a customer, and it came out as, hold me for a second. Don't know if that happened over the phone or in person, two different uh, events totally. I once walked into a subway and asked for a moot ball feet long and just walked out. I can never go back. I went to hand someone a bowl of hot soup. My brain tried to say, careful, it's hot, here's your soup. Instead, I blurted out, careful, it's soup. (laughs) Yesterday at Target, I've, I've had a version of this, and perhaps many of you have. Yesterday at Target, the cashier said, your receipt is in the bag, and I responded, you too. Dude at PacSun asked for my number while I was cashing out. I was like, ha ha, sorry, I'm not really interested. He looks at me and says, I meant for the rewards program. Three years ago, a cute guy I worked with wanted to give me a fist bump. I thought he was pretending to hold an invisible microphone, so I leaned forward and said, hello. (laughs) And the best for last. (laughs) I was at the airport, and the TSA agent told me to scan my license face down, but I just heard, scan, face down. So I put my face on the scanner and waited. (laughs) I wish this was a joke, but no, it happened, and the TSA guy could not stop laughing, and now I have to go into witness protection. The next thing I found, though, was a mountain of material in both written and video form to assist people in becoming better conversationalists. I always prefer written to video, so I went to that first, and the first thing I saw was 15 things to do to become a better conversationalist. (laughs) I read the list, and I'll admit, all 15 things had their merit, but I just thought about that poor soul who's trying to memorize 15 things to be a better conversationalist, or has the uh, list in their pocket, in the midst of a conversation, trying to think about what am I doing, what do I need to do, you know, make eye contact, uh, and just, you're not going to be able to do number four, which was listen, because the brain is constantly going through the 15 things to become a better conversationalist. Now, I share the concern of being better, a better conversationalist. It may surprise you. But uh, I have not always been such a delightfully loquacious conversationalist. (laughs) If it doesn't surprise you, go ahead and pretend that it does, please. For me, the fear was not saying the wrong thing at an inappropriate time. It was the horrible thought of the conversation that just died too soon. Having nothing to say, I'm sorry to look like grandma, but... I can read my notes, but I can't see you, so I'm going to put them down here like grandma and grandpa, all right? The the context, the situation where we're supposed to be talking, but the conversation is lagging and dying, and it just won't get going again. First time I was ever concerned about this, of course, was in 1978, when I turned 16 years old, and I began dating. Dating was horribly intimidating to me. At 16, I was not confident about much, except for my ability to mess something up. And so, I tell you, if you were a girl around me, my age at 16, if you wanted me to ask you out, you'd better almost ask me out first, because the horror of rejection was too much, 
And then if you did get to the point where I asked somebody out, the pressure of that first date was just absolutely tremendous. You women, you sit around at, hoping somebody at, you don't know the pressure that we go through. Because now everything, us, our personality, our care, everything's on referendum in that one night. Because we've got to do everything right just in the hopes that you'll want to go out with us a second time. And oh my gosh, and the worst thing was, oh, just sitting in the car, radio playing, driving, trying to think, what can we talk about, what can we talk about, and the conversation is dead, nothing, and you knew it was DOA, you know, this is not going to a uh, second date. And the second time it really, I really wrestled with this was in 1990, I had just been hired to preach at uh, Cornerstone Christian Church, my first full-time pastorate, and it became my responsibility, of course, to follow up on guests that had visited the congregation for the first time. This was almost like a first date on steroids. This was even worse. Because the first date had already happened. They came and visited at church. Now what you had to do was go inside their home and ask for an evaluation, basically. So how was the date? (laughs) Am I a good kisser? Did you enjoy the sermon? How did it all go? Do you think you want to come back? It was very intimidating. Then my dad gave me a piece of advice that I wish he had given me back in 1978, but still, he gave me a piece of advice, and he said, Tracy, listen, it's not that difficult. Everybody's favorite topic of conversation is the exact same thing, themselves. He said, you get inside someone's living room, you sit down, and you start scanning. You look for pictures, you look for plaques, you look for artwork, you look for places they visited, whatever, you look... And you start asking questions. And it really isn't that difficult. So if you're wondering this morning, instead of online, 15 ways to a better conversation, here's Tracy's two ways to becoming a better conversationalist. One, assume the other person is at least in one way, but probably many ways, far more interesting than you are. Two, be inquisitive and don't stop asking questions and follow-up questions until you discover that one way, that they are, in fact, more interesting than you. That's really about it. I'll give you this, 2A, 2A. If you want, have some questions memorized, stock questions to go to in case you're not sitting in their living room looking at pictures and artwork and curios and different things, and you can ask some interesting questions. Now, also back in April of 1990, along with worrying about my conversational ability, I had a few other concerns as a new minister. And I felt that my primary responsibility was to be able to prepare interesting and relevant sermons. And of course, the sermon fits in the larger context of the worship service. And so I felt like I really needed to go back and go, okay, how does all this work? What what is happening? What is going on? To understand how a good sermon worked within a worship service, I needed to know how a worship service was supposed to work. Why do we do what we do? Why do we sing? Why do we do communion? Why do we take up an offering? You can tell even that remark's very dated. You don't take up an offering here. Uh, Why do we do what we do? Why do we do it in the order that we do it? If you haven't been to church in a really long time, the church I grew up in, I mean, the, the order, it was just established, set in stone, as if Moses had given it. And right in the middle of the service, you would do communion, and immediately following, you would do offering. And the plate would be passed. And I had an uncle who had said he, he never was happy with that. He didn't like it. He said it, it reminded him of being in a restaurant. You've had your meal, and now you have to pay for it. You know. And I thought about that, and I go, okay, yeah, I, I, I kind of get that. I see that. But wh- why do we do what we do, the order that we do it? What is exactly supposed to be happening in a worship service, and how does the sermon fit into that? So my personal process To study is, if I'm going to be confronted with a passage or a subject, I try to exhaust it myself, first of all, by myself. And so out came the strong, I almost thought of bringing it with me this morning as a visual aid, but again, I'm just too old school. Sorry, Neil. My old Strong's Concordance, you know, it's big enough for the family or for the coffee table. Big old sucker. Every word of the Bible, I turn to worship. Worshiping, worshipers. And of course, because it's New King James, or it's King James, worshipeth. And I basically started at number one, and I looked every reference on the subject. I was going to do a comprehensive study of all of the references to worship within the Scriptures to get this worked out. All the references to worship didn't yield much insight, 
descriptive word. This is worship, that is worship, we're going to go worship. But it started to get interesting in the second category of words when I got to worshipped. Because then what I started seeing were these spontaneous acts of worship and what inspired them. The first three, and I'm just going to ask you to trust me, I'm going to show it to you in the first three instances and just ask you to trust me that it's a pattern that pretty much went throughout all of Scripture. Genesis 24, just going to tell you the story. Um, uh, Abraham needs, he's, he's nearing the end of his life and he needs a um, wife for his son Isaac. So he tells his servant, I don't want my son marrying one of the local girls, all right? You got to go back home and find me one of our family and you got to bring her back. She needs to be a good girl, not one of the local girls. And so imagine being the servant and tasked with that responsibility. Go, go find my son a wife. <laughs> okay. So he packs up and he travels home. And he's getting close to the homeland, and he asks God, he prays. He says, God, give me a sign. Actually, God, I'm going to give you the sign. Uh, and the first woman that completes this task, I will assume that this is the right woman. And the sign was this. It would have been very traditional to uh, offer a traveler a drink of water. But he says, God, I'm looking for the young lady who not only offers me some water, but decides to offer all of my camels some water as well. Pretty good sign. He's looking for a heart of service. This might be a good girl uh, for, my, uh, for Abraham's son. So he does that. First girl comes along, offers him a drink, offers his camel's drink, feeds uh, or drink or uh, gives water to his entourage. Finds out that he says, "Young lady, who uh, who's your father?" And finds out this is Abraham's kin. This is exactly who I was sent to look for. And the scripture says he bowed his head and he worshipped. Okay, I don't think he sung any songs. I don't think he passed an offering plate. I don't think anybody popped out of the bushes and preached a sermon. All he really did was offer a very brief prayer of thanksgiving. God, thank you. You are faithful to me. You've brought me exactly to where I need to be. God, thank you. The second instance of spontaneous worship, Exodus 4.31 all that good stuff about Moses and running off and then God calling him with the burning bush, bringing him back to Egypt, and he gets back to Egypt and he meets with the leaders of the children of Israel, explains the situation, here I am, God has sent me, and we're getting out of here. And it says the leaders of Israel worshipped God. Again, we're not told exactly what they did. I probably was not, a, it was probably a very simple and brief service probably was akin to previously in Genesis, they prayed, they thanked God, they praised Him. We've been remembered. God has not forgotten us. God is going to save us. God is taking us out of bondage. And There were some high, some high fives and some fist bumps and you know, just some spontaneous joy expressed. They worshiped. The third is uh, Joshua chapter 5. The Israelite children, they're in the promised land now, and they're looking at their first big battle of Jericho, and Joshua goes up to oversee the city. And as he's looking out, trying to make his military plan, he sees this gentleman off to the side with his sword drawn. You have to like this. Joshua is, he's over 80 years old right now, you know. And uh, he walks up to this guy, and he says, Are you with us, or are you against us? (laughs) And the man responds, Uh, I'm captain of the Lord's host. Take your shoes off. The ground on which you're standing is holy. Now, how many times did Moses tell Joshua the story of the burning bush? You know? And that connection, no doubt, was made. And Joshua, we are told, bows down and he worships. And he gets into the position of worship. Probably, I imagine, if you thought that you literally were looking at a representation of God eating dirt is probably something that would come very natural. And he literally bowed down before the captain of the Lord's host and worshipped him. And again, we're not told exactly what he did, and it could be simply the act of going and bowing down was worship, because that act in itself communicates, does it not? It says, I am not worthy, (laughs) and I will eat dirt in your presence. 
Now, a pattern emerges. It's a very simple and short pattern, but it is this. God acts. There is then an interpretation of that act, and man responds in an appropriate manner to that message. Worship is man's response to God's revelation. And after my long study, I was very, I'd worked it down, and that to me was the statement. That was worship in its purest form, in its most base definition, without getting all flowery, worship is man's response to God's revelation. And then at that point, I began, okay, time to start reading what other people have to say. And I, I realized, please, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stretch hard and, and pat myself on the back a little bit. But as I'm reading different books on worship, they all keep referencing this classic work by Andrew W. Blackwood that was written back in the 1930s, The Fine Art of Public Worship. So I decided, well, everybody's referencing this. I need to read it. I went and bought it, and I started reading it. And right there in the introduction, do you know what Andrew W. Blackwood says? Worship is man's response to God's revelation. I was running around my desk. <laughs> you know, it was like, oh, gosh, that was exciting. I discovered something that another guy did almost 100 years ago. <laughs> but it was still my discovery. And, uh, as you know, and I still have it today, and I carry it with me. And it was, it was a powerful moment, but I took it as confirmation. So, when I'm telling you this morning, worship is man's response to God's revelation. It's not just Tracy that's telling you that, but Tracy and Andrew W. Blackwood. And he was famous. He wrote books. So, it's got to be true. What is the heart of worship? Now, let me take that definition, definition and shape it just a little bit and try and make it even simpler. Worship is conversation. Oh, that's why he was talking about being a good conversationalist. <laughs> I was wondering what that rambling was about. Yes. Conversation is a learned skill. Worship is our conversation with God. Ergo, worship is a learned skill. It is something we can be better at, something that we can get better at. If you leave a boring conversation, you may have been the problem. <laughs> if you found a worship service boring, you may have been the problem and not the worship service. Because worship is conversation. And that's a two-way street. And it takes two people who know what they're doing for a good conversation to happen. We need to be working daily on our worship skills. Now remember back to our sequence. Watch for God to act. And this is significant that God most often reveals himself in actions, not in words. Now, of course, the most supreme revelation of God is Jesus Christ, which was the perfect merging of action and speech. Every time Jesus did something, God was doing it. Every time Jesus said something, God was saying it. Apart from the life of Jesus, God primarily worked through, revealed himself through actions. He's an action-oriented God. That's why the Bible is a history book, a collection of stories. It's not a philosophy book. It's not written by a few holy men sitting on a mountaintop theorizing about God. It is a history, an exciting history of things happening and then people realizing because God was working, this is what we learned about Him. God reveals Himself in actions. We interpret those in the Scriptures. We're very thankful to have had prophets, prophetesses, and apostles who have interpreted them for us so that we can have the proper interpretation. But God acts, man interprets, and then we respond in an appropriate manner to the message that God is giving us. And that is our worship offered back. Now, this needs to happen on a daily basis because God does, has not stopped acting. And each of us need to be able to foster these spontaneous moments of worship. Tuesday, I was driving through downtown Lake Worth, and um, every Tuesday morning, there is some sort of free food giveaway that happens, and the cars just line up for about a mile. I'm embarrassed to admit but I'm going to admit to you that my first reactions were probably more cynical. Not probably. See, hey, I even soften it. My first reactions were cynical. All right? And I'm thinking, what do you do? Oh, you know. 
And so it took God a little bit to work through that. And then just this last Tuesday, I'm driving, I'm looking at some of the cars, and I'm thinking, what do you need to be in a free food giveaway for? And then all of a sudden, it was like, well, Tracy, because they need to be in a free food giveaway. That's why. Do you think somebody with that car would be in a free food giveaway if they didn't need to be in a free food giveaway and waiting in their car for four hours to get some free food? And eventually, the worship experience got to me, and it happened, and I realized, and I heard God say, Tracy, you're blessed, and your family is blessed. Throughout this entire COVID experience, there has never been a day where you wondered if you were going to have a paycheck. There has never been a day where you wondered how you were going to get some food. There has never been a day where you had to worry about anything, and not just you, but your kids, and not just your kids, but your siblings, and not just your siblings, but your... Tracy, you are blessed. And I was driving down the road, I worshipped. I was driving, so ergo, I did not close my eyes, and I did not bow my head. (laughs) But I worshipped. And I offered up a prayer of thanksgiving to God, because He loves me. And He's taken, I don't want to say that, He's taken care of me. Other people have had a much more difficult time, and God loves them too. Always got to be careful how you say things. I thanked God for his protection and his provision that he has given me and my family. A couple weeks ago, Crystal says, I feel like going for a a, a walk on the beach. Okay, let's go for a walk on the beach. So up to Juneau, we drove. We're walking north on the beach. It's just absolutely gorgeous. The sun is setting off to our left. You're getting those vivid orange colors. Of course, you have the waves breaking to the right. The sound of the beach is just majestic and the, 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 the crashing of the waves. There was an osprey. I don't, ever, I don't think I've ever seen an osprey flying so low before. I almost felt like if I took a running jump, I might have been able to jump up and grab him. And I'm just kind of awash in the beauty of God's nature and his thinking about his magnificence and whatnot. And we passed this couple who apparently had come out to enjoy it as well. She's sitting on her beach towel. He's a few steps away, facing the ocean. I'm just like, oh my gosh, why don't you just stay in your living room, in the air conditioning, if you're just going to stare at your phones? Come on, folks. This is a worship moment to look at nature and to reason back to the Creator and His power and His mercy and His grace. You understand that's exactly what Jesus did in the Sermon on the Mount. Look at the birds. They don't sow, they don't reap. But God feeds them. Look at the lilies of the field. They they don't spin. They don't darn and knit. That's not what Jesus said, but it's the same spirit. And yet God clothes them beautifully. How much more does God love you? Why do you worry about what you're going to eat and what you're going to wear? That is a worship experience waiting for us every time we walk outside the door to see part of God's nature and to reason back to his love for us, his power and his majesty. We need to work on these daily conversations with God, looking for Him to act, listening for His voice, and responding in a very simple and appropriate way. Sometimes as simple as, God, you're wonderful. That's worship. It's conversation. God speaks, we respond. God speaks, we respond. Sometimes God acts so powerfully and so dramatically that we just can't stop talking about it. For the Old Testament believer, this was the Exodus and the Sinai event. And for 1,600 years, they kept meeting at the tabernacle and then the temple to talk about it, to worship as a community, because it was an event that was so powerful for all of us. We meet as a community, and then the worship leaders script worship so that we can all worship together in unison. For the New Testament believers, it is the Calvary event, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that is so powerful that for every Sunday now, for 2,000 years, we've been meeting and gathering, the community has, because it is such an incredible event, we can't stop talking about it. Worship is conversation, and that's what we do when we're coming to Sunday morning worship, to talk to God about what He's done, and supremely what He's done through Jesus Christ on Calvary's event. The community gathers to worship in unison. 
Unison worship requires a script, and that is what our worship planners do each week. They create a script for us to come and have a conversation with God in unison so that we are all hearing the same message at the same time and typically responding to that message in the same way. But the heart of worship is still this core truth that worship is conversation. There's a back and forth that is happening throughout the entire experience. Viewing worship as conversation, I believe, can deepen the worship experience for both the planner and the worshiper. Planning becomes so much more than just, well, what's, what's the topic for the sermon, and let's pick some songs that match the theme. From beginning to end, our planners need to be thinking, okay, what's the conversation? What is God saying at this point? What do I want the worshiper to repeat back at this point? How is the conversation going? Is it focused? Is it meaningful? Is it beneficial? Is it spiritual? What belongs in the worship service? To evaluate, and I start evaluating going after my definition, it's like, okay, there's only two things that belong in a worship service. Elements that allow God to speak to the worshiper and elements that allow the worshiper to speak back to God. Nothing else belongs. And I started to go hardcore, and I started thinking, the first thing my brain went to was announcements. And I'm like, announcements? And I started feeling bad about announcements. And it's like, it just seemed like an administrative task that we were doing. But the more I thought about it, I realized, no, no, there is a message from God that comes even in announcements. I want you to be more involved. I want you to be more active. I want you to connect with the people around you that are in this community. And God speaks even through announcements. As long as we make them sound really interesting. Um, but anyway, uh, these things need to be evaluated. I could go kind of crazy right now and apply this principle to everything from beginning to end in a worship service to kind of explain what I'm thinking, but I, I really think, A, that would be redundant and overkill, and B, it would take us way too long because I would ramble on and you'd hate me at the end of this service. But there is one thing that I want to talk about about being able to evaluate everything that happens in a worship service from beginning to end. What is God saying? What is the worshiper saying to God? The very first thing that happens for anyone in worship is they enter the building. And this is what I'm going to take it to a deeper level. Most everybody thinks about first impressions. What are first impressions for somebody that's walking into the building, especially a first-time guest? What are they going to experience? What are they going to feel? And to that end, I want to say kudos for those doors back there. That has been needed for a hundred years. <laughs> Hy hyperbole. My journey has been very different, not one that I would have expected. It began as a preacher, 1990, in the ministry, going to seminary and whatnot, and it's ending as me not being in ministry. And when the camp sold, and if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it, everybody. That, when the camp sold and I pretty much left ministry, we, we began looking for a place to worship. Where are we going to worship? And so I was at both ends of the spectrum. From a preacher who's all concerned about how do we impress a first-time guest to now the first-time guest. And I'm, I'm, I'm going places. And I, I want you to know, and again, it just might be me, it is intimidating walking up to a building that you've never been in before and not being able to see into the building. That is a huge benefit. It's that, back of that, that, that back entrance was intimidating if you're not already a part of the community and you don't know what's inside. And that's, that's a good sign. I praise you for that. That's money well spent. But one thing that's on my heart as someone who has been a first-time guest now many times is the way you're greeted and treated inside the room once you're inside. You know how many points you get for a friendly greeter for the first-time guest? Zero. You know why? Because I know they're supposed to be there and they're supposed to be friendly. And you pick somebody friendly to be at your front door and to greet me as I came in. So you get zero points for a friendly greeter. You know how many points you get for a staff member coming up and greeting me at some point in the service? You get zero points for that. You know why? Because they're paid to do that. 
They're on the roll. It's their responsibility to try and make a good impression and come talk to me and hope, you know. I'll give you a few points if your minister is, is young, has a great personality, good looking, Vietnamese. So you all get two points for that. I was going to say three, and I just dropped it to two real quick, just to even be better. There's no points for that. You know what desperately needs to happen? Because, again, we're not talking about first impressions. We're talking about what are they hearing God say. Because when your first-time guest leaves this wor- their first worship service, they're going to hear God say one of two things. I want you back, or please don't come back. They're going to hear God say that. We spent over three years visiting a particular church that will remain nameless. In all of that time, and I'm not hyperbolic here, no one spoke to us. No one inside the auditorium ever spoke to us. Staff members spoke to us a couple of times, headed out the door. Nice to have you here with us. We were in a church last week, and uh, we got to the point where it's true. Hey, turn around and say hello to five people, you know, or something like that. My daughter, Ashen, turned to me and said, best part of COVID ever, the abolition of say hello to five people in church. I said, amen, sister. <laughs> I hate that, especially as a guest, because here's what happened. You walk in, the greeter says hello, hands you the bulletin, yeah, okay, whatever. You go and you sit down. Then you sit there for 15 minutes while the place fills up beside you and nobody says a word to you. Then the preacher says, turn around and tell three people you love them. Love you, brother. Thanks. Then you sit there the rest of the sermon, and then church is over, and no one says a word to you as you and them walk out the door. And I hear God, we were just stubborn. Because again, we've been going to church our entire life, we know what church is like, and we had decided that this would be a good place for us to go, and we went despite the fact that for three years, no one ever said a word to us. Not a stinking word. Brothers and sisters, Understand that when you look around the room and you see a face that you do not recognize, and you think, you even think it might be a visitor, understand that you're speaking for God. When you go up to them and say, I am so glad you're here. Is it really that difficult? Every church needs to have a small nucleus of people who make that their mission, and it would be one of the most important ministries that anyone can perform in the church Look for faces you don't recognize and tell them you're glad they're here. And if you really want to go the extra mile, introduce them to one other person. And I promise you, when that person leaves, they're going to hear God say, I want you to come back here. You belong here. Worshipers, you're not attending a performance that you hope goes well, it's a conversation that you need to be involved in. And there's no reason, even if the script gets awkward and misses you at some point, there's no reason for your mind to disengage and to leave the conversation. We sang a song this morning I didn't recognize. I've heard it for the first time. Typically, I don't like that. I just don't. But the Psalms say, sing a new song, and you got to sing new songs sometime. But I didn't go... I don't know this song. I'll just wait for it to finish. One can meditate on the words. If you don't even like the sound of your own voice, imagine yourself singing it. There are times when songs tell us to do things that you know you can't do. What's that one song? Something about thumb down, turn around, and you know, or, or do something. Yeah, raise my hands and spin around. That raise my hand and spin around song sung that in a lot, of, a lot of church service. I haven't seen a single person do it yet. Thank you. <laughs> it would be awkward. That's an awkward conversation. Um, but I imagine myself doing it. Because you know what? I know God's got a free ticket inside my head. 
Whatever I think, whatever I imagine, whatever I see, God's there. And if the particular context of the worship that morning, I don't feel free to raise my hands or do things that I might typically do, I'm doing it inside my head. If I don't like the song, the musicality of the song, and I'm not connecting with it, then I'll focus on the words, and I'll turn it into a prayer as I'm standing there. It's a conversation. Don't, just because something gets a little awkward, decide, well, I'm done with this conversation. That's rude. <laughs> That's rude. Have you ever had somebody turn around and walk away from you in the middle of a conversation? Like you're mid-sentence, and suddenly they're gone? That's why a lot of people worship. God's sitting there, yeah, okay, yeah, uh-huh. What do you, wait, wait, where'd you go? What happened? What'd you check out for? Stay in the conversation, and especially, I tell you, pull it together and focus during communion. Now, at the beginning of this sermon, I referenced this meal as the main course. That's just for the metaphor. The sermon is not the main course of a worship service. The Lord's Supper, in my opinion, is the main course of the worship service. Because if there's one message that i got to hear from God. I don't care whether it's Father's Day, Mother's Day, July 4th, Armistice Day, or if the theme is how to raise your children, and I don't care because mine are already raised and they're on their own. I don't care what, regardless of the theme, you know what I want to hear? I want to hear Jesus telling me, I love you, I died for you, and you're my child. This is why I love doing the Lord's Supper every week. What week don't you want to hear that message? There are many churches that don't do it, and that typically it's, it's just what I've heard is, well, we're afraid it'll lose its meaning. I despise that argument. I have never heard a single preacher say, I'm going to stop preaching because if I do it every week, I'm afraid it'll lose its meaning. I've never heard a worship leader say, I think we need to stop singing for a while because if we keep doing it every week, it's going to lose its meaning. And I've definitely never heard a church treasurer ever say, we're going to stop taking up the offering every week because I'm afraid it's going to lose its meaning. Why then do we apply that thinking to the Lord's Supper? We can't do it every week because we're afraid it's going to lose its meaning. Are you insane? It is the meaning. It is the meaning of Christian worship, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I want to hear God tell me every week, your sins and lawless deeds I remember no more. I've got to hear that. I've got to hear God tell me that. So being a good worshiper is being a good conversationalist. And so I close out by taking you back to my two points. <laughs> Assume the other person in at least one way, but probably many ways, is far more interesting than you are. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? God is. He's a lot more interesting than us. And so the best thing that we can do to deepen our worship is to come to the worship service with a sense of expectant discovery. Knowing that it's not a program we're going to witness, but it is a conversation that we're going to have with God. And from the moment I hit the door, I'm listening. I'm listening for what he has to say, and then when he says something to me, I'm going to respond. And then the script is going to unfold, and we're going to go back and forth, and for an hour and 15 minutes, God and I are going to chit-chat. We're having a talk. I'm visiting with my best friend, the person who has done more for me than anyone else. God my Father, Jesus Christ and His Spirit. Be inquisitive and don't stop asking questions and follow up questions until you discover that one way in which they are more interesting than you are. Uh, sounds to me like a pretty good uh, strategy for worship. Show up eager, inquisitive, listen to the voice of God, and then respond appropriately. And I pray that as you go through this um, sermon series, that you will learn more about worship, more about conversing with God, and it will even mean more to you when the psalmist says, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God. And we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Today, if, would hear his voice. Father God, I thank you for acting in our world, in our history, throughout all of the centuries, and Lord, of course, most supremely when you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the perfect expression of divinity and humanity. 
the Father, not just to show us how to live, but to die for us, so that the gulf that existed between us and you because of our sin could be erased. And you could bring us into your family. You could indwell in us with your spirit. Father, this is such a tremendous truth. And Lord, I pray that we just won't be able to stop talking about it. That we can't imagine a time when we're not coming to church and talking to you and sharing with you. And Father, I pray that as we continue to worship you, we will do it deeper and more meaningful and that it will bring us closer and closer together. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.